Hey, Remote Pilot 101, Jason here, and it is just an awesome time here at M0A.com and RemotePilot101.com as we are rolling out version three of our Remote Pilot 101 course inside our proprietary learning management system utilizing what we call and trademarked the Aviation Mastery Method. I want to showcase to you some of these new videos in the new course. Many of you are already lifetime members of ours, so you can see these, but those of you who are not, I just want to give you a little taste of what the new course looks like. And I want to share with you now, and we're just going to play the clip in its entirety on airport and field operations. I realize this has been one of the larger modules for the Remote Pilot Ground School, in part because we've been diving into the sectional chart. Without the sectional, a hard copy or a digital on your tablet, you have no idea what kind of airspace you're in, which can lead to a lot of problems. So expect to see a lot of questions that reference the sectional and identifying objects such as towers, airports, airspace as well, and finding things in latitude and longitude as we learned in this lesson. You'll also be finding communications frequencies as well as identifying the type of airspace being referenced. A good portion of the questions uh, such as, uh, when you are operating at such and such a location near the airport, you hear a pilot announce they're entering a 45 degree for uh, entry for such and such a runway, where would you look for the traffic? I'm rambling now, but they're scenario-based questions is my point. We're gonna go over some of those. You can expect to answer questions about those in the field operations with an emphasis on acquiring all available information, as in what information you're required to have prior to the flight. Let's begin our review with a review of the notices to airmen, or NOTAMs. NOTAMs are acquired during a weather briefing. They are used to notify pilots about pertinent information that could impact the flight. Let's review why they are issued. NOTAMs warn us about airport closures, like if there's been an accident uh, at the airport, or a runway or taxiway is undergoing repair. NOTAMs can also be issued to let you know about changes to airspace, like Class E changes into Class D, because now they have a control tower at the airport. NOTAMs are issued to let us know when special use airspace, like military operations areas, are in use. NOTAMs are also issued if there's a change in radio frequency or a navigational aid is out of service. They're also used to advise us about obstructions at or near an airport, like cell phone towers or even temporary cranes if there's construction going on. Finally, NOTAMs are used to warn pilots about an outage of GPS service. That's a big deal for us. Finally, we can check NOTAMs to check for something called temporary flight restrictions, TFRs. TFRs are temporary no-fly zones designed to keep unauthorized aircraft out of particular airspace. They can pop up literally with a single phone call from the right people. This is why you always want to check your weather briefing from a product like 1-800-WX-BRIEF by logging in or calling them because it records that, yes, Jason Shepard received this weather briefing. So if I bust a TFR, I can say, hey, when I checked, that TFR was not there. That way you're kind of covered from that standpoint. Let's review what situations warrant the FAA putting up a TFR. TFRs are put up for very important people, such as heads of state, the president of the United States. For example, travel, they actually travel in a TFR that's a 30 nautical mile bubble. Basically, everywhere the president goes, this little 30 nautical mile bubble follows them. TFRs are also issued in the case of forest fires, because very often the aircraft being used to fight the fires, well, it's important we stay out of the way so we don't compromise their safety. TFRs are also put in place by law enforcement when they're doing investigations, perhaps. Most common, though, a TFR is issued over a large gathering. Something like a sporting event, like the Super Bowl, car races, concerts, fairs, those can sometimes trigger TFRs. TFRs vary in size and duration, so check the NOTAMs carefully. The difference between a TFR and, say, a prohibited area, which are permanent no-fly zones, is that prohibited areas don't go away, and there's no chance you're getting in one of those. There are permanent no-fly zones. Disneyland and Disney World are actually the two. They are technically TFRs, but they've been there since 2002. So they are very, very long <laughs> temporary flight restrictions. Now, there are also prohibited areas over places of strategic military importance. The White House, nuclear submarine bases, shipyards, and the like. So these prohibited areas are marked on the sectional chart with the letter P. Now let's take a look at the sectional chart to identify some objects in both MSL, mean sea level, and AGL, 
above ground level. You might get a question asking, hey, what is the altitude in AGL of the lit object six miles southwest of the Savannah Airport? And there's an excerpt from the sectional chart to refer to. And trust me, I've covered this question how many times now? Two, three times at least, and we're gonna cover it some more. Very popular actual question. You need to be careful with those types of questions though. Did they ask for it in MSL or did they ask for it in AGL? Because both those numbers are on the sectional chart. You might be asked, what is the altitude in AGL of the lit tower uh, located northwest of the Hampton Roads Executive Airport? We know from our studies and from the legend, remember legend one is very, very valuable to use as a, as a key in a way. Uh, it's located at the front of the Airman Knowledge Test Supplement that you're gonna be issued when you go to the testing center. A lighted tower looks like what? That's a tower with some lightning bolts coming off the top. Find the tower in question, find the numbers indicating its height. According to the sectional chart, the height of the tower in MSL is 1,282 feet. The number beneath it in parentheses, that's its height above ground level. The way to remember that, again, it's the really bad aviation joke because in manned aviation, we set our altimeters um, to MSL. We fly pressure altitudes. The top, the, the top of the tower, I hit the top of the tower in my airplane. The top number is what my altimeter would say. The bottom number is how far I would actually fall. The difference between MSL and AGL. Most of your altitude questions we deal with in the field reference, obviously, above ground level. Remember, unless we have a waiver, the drone is not supposed to fly higher than 400 feet above ground level. The exception is unless we are over a structure, like a tower, in which case we can be 400 feet above the top of that structure if it's for that inspection. So going back to the figure, let's say you get a question in the form of a scenario. You have a job to take a video a half mile to the north of the Hampton Roads Executive Airport. The airport manager has requested that you monitor the common traffic advisory frequency during the operation. You hear a transmission indicating that the aircraft is on downwind for runway nine. Where should you look for that aircraft? The options might include west of the airport, south of the airport, north of the airport. We recall that the top of the legend, top of our chart here is north, and that unless indicated with the letters RP, that's a right pattern, that the turns are to the left, unless indicated RP. So an aircraft landing on runway nine would be landing to the east. Downwind is 180 degrees the opposite of that. So the airplane on downwind would be on a westerly heading, 270, which would put them north of the airport. If you are asked about the pattern altitude for aircraft at that airport, something we need to know so we don't accidentally enter their traffic pattern, the first thing you need to do is find out the field elevation for Hampton Roads Executive. Do you see the number 28? This tells us the airport elevation is 28 feet mean sea level. Since the airport traffic pattern at most airports is 1,000 feet above ground level, the airport traffic pattern is probably 1,028 feet, which equates to 1,000 feet above ground ground level. Now, our drone should not be up that high without a waiver, but since it's an airport traffic pattern, we need to recognize that aircraft will be lower during takeoffs and landings. While we're at it, these magenta flags you see here, one on the airport and one to the left of that tower, tell us those places are reporting points for air traffic, and we should stay alert because air traffic tends to congregate in those areas. You may be asked what frequency for the automated weather at that same Hampton Roads Executive Airport. Again, we reference figure 20 from the Knowledge Test Supplement. The acronym AWOS stands for Automated Weather Observation System. It tells us the frequency is 118.375. If you're asked about the communications frequency, you look for the letter C in the circle, and note in this case it's 122.975. As a remote pilot, again, it's super unlikely you'll be making any radio calls at the airport unless it's a part of this authorization or waiver. But if you did, it would sound something like such and such airport, drone 1234, operating half mile west of the airport below 400 feet. And that would be it. Again, only if you're instructed to do so. Most of the time we use communication frequencies to monitor the other traffic, especially manned aircraft in the area to determine where they are in relation to us and to check weather on the automated weather frequency. Other types of broadcast frequencies also come into play for drones because operational instructions are transmitted to drones on either VHF, very high frequency, or UHF, ultra high frequency. Most drones are utilizing VHF. Our two most common frequencies are 2.4 gigahertz and 5.8 gigahertz. 
Drones transmit their telemetry, the pictures, the video, on 2.4 gigahertz. Control information for the drone, those instructions for flight, climb, turn, descend, hover, transmitted over the 5.8 gigahertz. Both frequencies, remember, are line of sight transmission, meaning the drone has to be within view of the control station to work properly. If we lose that line of sight, the drone stops responding to instructions. That's what's known as a lost link. During a lost link, many drones just go into a recovery mode. Uh, some just sort of hover until they get another signal to act on. Some will come back to the home location and auto land after a few minutes. Other drones sort of take off on their own, a condition known as a flyaway. I had one as I shared earlier. You need to be aware of and mindful of what else might be in the vicinity and transmitting, like another drone that's operating on these frequencies as well. That could lead to a lost link or a flyaway. Now let's talk about privacy briefly here. A lot of people don't like the idea of someone taking pictures or video of them or their property without permission. So much so that the guidance is actually developed for remote pilots. If able, while operating in a public place, notify the public before and during the flight, like putting up a few well-placed signs warning the public about the flight, uh, such as, hey, area closed for a private event sign. Honestly, it would work. Keep people away and, you know, mugging for the camera and everything else. Next, don't violate a person's reasonable expectation of privacy, especially on private property. Don't ever fly backyards, that sort of stuff, if you can help it. Warn people you're going to be there. Like, you've been hired to take video of a roof for a two-story home. Warn the neighbors when you're going to be there so you're, they don't think you're focusing on their home. Same for real estate photos. Finally, don't gather personal data for no reason. Respect the mission of your drone. When you're learning how to use your drone, get a few friends to help you. They can act as a team of visual observers to make sure your drone just doesn't go out of bounds, essentially. And if you're doing a job that involves the collection of sensitive data, respect that it is sensitive. You have to be a professional in this situation. You may need to have your crew sign some NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, or the person who hires you for that job may insist on one to protect from data loss. Um, if you do get video uh, or photos of someone out in public and they ask you to delete it, simply comply. Listen to their concerns. Don't use your drones to harass people. Switching gears now, when we are using a map or a sectional, we find things using latitude and longitude. I know your GPS unit does this digitally, but on a sectional or map, latitude and longitude are those black lines with numbers and the tick marks that represent minutes and degrees. This combination of latitude and longitude and minutes and degrees, those are called coordinates. When given coordinates, we always start with the latitude. Lines of latitude are known as our parallels. They run east to west to measure the distance in reference to north or south of the equator. They cross the prime meridian, that's the longitudinal line that crosses through Greenwich, England. Right angles is how they cross, and they're shortest actually near the north and south pole and longest near the equator. That's latitude I'm talking about now. Lines of longitude run north to south. Lines of longitude are known as meridians. The zero line, prime meridian, Greenwich, England, like we just referenced here. Lines of longitude are farthest apart at the equator and meet at the poles. Lines of longitude cross the equator at right angles and are equal in length. Let's find the latitude of 48 degrees. Now, find the line of longitude of 101 degrees. Each one of those tick marks is one minute. The larger tick marks indicate 10 minutes. I also want you to notice that these figures have a scale at the bottom. So if you're asked to find a particular object at a certain distance from an airport, let's say uh, you could use a piece of scratch paper to kind of make the ruler, make the scale again to measure it on there. Remember, if you get stuck uh, and don't remember the symbology, where do we go? Back to the legend, back to legend one, so you can refer to that. I know we covered a lot at rapid speed. If you need to go back over anything, this is the lesson to go back over some videos. Because this, I'm telling you, 60, 70% of your final exam, your real test, is going to be from this lesson. So Remote Pilot 101, I hope you really, really enjoyed seeing that. One thing you know that really sets us apart is we're in the business of teaching real-world applicability. As you can see from that video, it's not just, yes, we talk about what will be on the test. But I never want rote memorization. My goal is to have you just out there being that safe real-world 
operator. So listen, can't wait. I hope you'll check out the new course as we migrate everything over to our m0a.com URL. So Remote Pilot 101 will be a product on m0a.com. So links in the description, all in the description explaining more of that. So have a wonderful rest of your day. And most importantly, remember, the good pilot is always learning every day, everyone. We'll see you.